All right, welcome everybody to the spring 2021 State of Local Marketing Address. Brian, you can throw me up on the screen. I'd like to introduce myself and welcome everybody. My name is Jeff Hershey. I'll come up on the screen here in just a second here as we uh, get StreamYard going. And I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to the State of Local Marketing for spring of 2021. So as you can see, we've got some uh, amazing and fellow uh, marketers and, and digital agency owners and product so and software publishers here with us today. We'll bring those uh, folks out here in just a minute. They're associates and some of them are some of the best friends of mine and business partners. And this is the third one that we've done in the last year. Um, really, the, the first one that we handled was about a year ago this week when kind of everything hit the fan. And we weren't quite sure what was going on with the industry, businesses were shutting down the pandemic, all that stuff. But the good news is we're now on the, the tail end of this. We're all starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Businesses are starting to kind of come out of hibernation. It's the rebirth, if you will, or you know, it's like spring, the, the flowers are starting to grow and, and, and bloom. And we're trying to help those businesses really either continue to grow and, and you know come out of that hibernation, or if they've been able to survive, help them thrive now and really take that next step forward. And today, we're all here today to talk about as you know, industry leaders and digital agency owners, what we're seeing in our industry right now, because everything you're gonna see on this group today is part of a mastermind and marketing group that works as a digital agency, but also creates products and, and publishes services for agencies just like yourself. I'll get to be the president of that group right now. And I'm lucky to have all the folks that are in the group with me, a large portion of them have joined us to share what's working for them, for you guys right now, as, as part of the state of uh, the address of what we're doing here in the spring of, of 2021 to help these businesses basically thrive and, and move forward. So through the past year, we've, we've been through a lot as a group, as digital agencies, as marketers. A year ago, a lot of us were seeing maybe 20, 30, or even 50% or even more, but probably around about 30 or 50% of our book of business either shut down or, or canceled. And we were all kind of in a scramble mode, right? We're grabbing at anything to figure out, you know, how can we keep that revenue up? How can we help these businesses survive? Because that's what we signed on us as digital agencies. We helped be the life raft for the last 12 months. You know, we were throwing out, you know, hey, here's how we can help you guys, you know, adjust to the digital shift that's happening right now. Or, you know, maybe you're not available uh, to be open. So here's some other ideas that you can do to generate revenue to help pay your staff, right? We're here to help those businesses basically survive and thrive as, as we move forward. So we're talking today a little bit about, you know, what I've noticed and then what the group here uh, has noticed and what we're doing specifically in our own basically level of expertise within our digital agencies and in our industry. And for me, what I've noticed is there's a digital shift that's happening over the last 12 months and especially in the adoption of, of contactless payments. Now I'm seeing a lot more than ever and I think you guys are as well. You see the scannable QR codes that are out there for payments, right? You can do that for digital menus as well, but I'm also seeing like text to pay um, and doing remote pay either through email or just directly on, on a website because people are able to now just use their smartphone um, and all the digital walls and opportunities that are out there. A lot of businesses are not fully capable to be ready to make that digital shift. And you have the opportunity with a simple potential foot in the door strategy to say, hey, look, we can get your business shifted to the new digital economy that's happening right now. And then you can have potential solutions from there. What we've seen inside of our agency and my agency here in Arizona is that a lot of those businesses are welcoming you now more than ever to, to help them make that shift. And then it allows you, after you've given them an ROI, shown them the value at maybe a, a low to, to medium ticket offer that just kind of gets your foot in the door to get them to trust you, right? To be able to show that, hey, look, you know, we're not looking for that large upfront fee. We're trying to make sure that you do survive. We're like the business rescue squad in a way, right? So with that, it then allows as they're ready to take those next steps, move forward for those medium and, and larger size contracts for you guys as you get going. So, you know, we're seeing some very important trends in our industries and in, in the different agencies that we all work through. And based on the specialties of the folks that are here today, we're actually going to share all of that information with you of what we're seeing. We're just here to give to you guys as digital agencies today. And the first speaker that I have that's gonna come out today is Rob Warner of Invisible PPC. And he's gonna talk a little bit about Google Ads and, and the trends that he's seeing as we now approach middle to the end of the quarter for the first quarter of 2021. So Rob, you wanna come out here for a second and just share a little bit about what you're seeing um, in Google Ad trends in 2021? 
I would absolutely love to, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. So this is going to be cool, guys. This is going to be a fun um, session. I think there's got lots of people with some great perspectives coming on the call today. Um, mine happens to be Google Ads. Um, I'm gonna, can I, I can share, share a screen, Jeff? Yeah, so um, we'll have uh, much Brian help you share the screen on that side. I'll do that. Just I'll share it, it. It. it should work. You should be able to see my screen now. Uh, I don't see it yet, Rob. Oh, oh, I see it. There's two rows. Hang on. Here we go. Um, hang on, Rob. No. <laughs> I see my screen, but I see you as well. I know. I know. I'm going gonna, gonna to put your screen up. Hang on. I'll put your screen up. A little technical difficulties, you guys. So I'll put your screen up. And, and if you can't, I'll just talk through it. It's fine. There How about this? Hey. Will this work? That'll do me. Right. So what I want to do is it's really easy when we're all in our, as we are in the UK at the moment, in our home offices, because we're not allowed to go into the actual office, the, you know, the one that we pay for, the one that currently is what I often describe as luxury furniture storage. Um, we're here in our homes doing our thing for our clients. One of the things that's really difficult to do outside of that is step back and go, OK, I know what I see within my universe but what's happening in the universe outside my four, my four walls? What's actually going on there? Um, and it's really easy to not see the big picture. And one of the things I'm very aware of is I'm, I, I participate in lots of Facebook groups. I'm sure you do too. Everybody's got an opinion. I mean, Facebook is never, ever short of an opinion on just about anything, and Google ads are no exception. I kind of not a big fan of opinions. I'm a much bigger fan of data. So uh, what we've been doing this last uh, 12 months is analyzing data. Um, well, I'm very fortunate. I have a mathematician full time on my staff. So he and I get together to work on what's happening, what does it mean, and what can we do with it. That's what I want to share with you today. So the first thing is to say, this has been no surprise, the robots are coming to Google Ads, and they are coming hard, and they are coming fast. They are here to stay. Um, there is a very clear view coming out of Google HQ right now, and they won't explicitly say this, um, but if you read between the lines of all the actions they're taking, their view is very much, agencies, we don't think you do a very good job. We don't trust you. We think we and our tech can do better, and by better, I mean make more money for our shareholders. Of course, that's done under the guise of user experience, of um, you know simplification, of improvement. But in reality, the short version is they don't believe that we as agency owners, as business owners who run Google Ads, do a particularly good job. And I'm going to show you how that translates into the actions that they've taken and what that means for you and I and everybody else in this space. Because by the way, I'm still a huge fan. There are huge opportunities in Google Ads right now, here and now. So to put everything together that you're going to see in the next few minutes today, I want everyone to have context as to where my data comes from. In this analysis alone, and this, that you've seen this slide in front of you, there is 8.5 million in ad spend, which is actually a small subset of our ad spend that we deal with, but it means that we don't just sit listening to computer fans calculate the whole time. Nearly 400,000 search terms, clicks, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we've looked at and applied math to to come to these data points today. So with that said, the first thing, you will hear the word smart an awful lot in the world of Google now. They smart everything. That's their thing. And one of the things they introduced a little while ago was something called smart campaigns. Um, and they kind of sucked. And they still kind of sucked. And what you can imagine a smart campaign is you say, I want to advertise based on a particular page on your website. So if you're a dentist and you've got an implants page, you say, show me ads to send people to this page um, and let Google figure out the rest. It's basically what they are. Um, so the first thing Google has to do is figure out what's on the page. The next thing they have to do is then send ads to it and so on. Huge amount of trust being placed in Google Ads to do that. Now, look what's happened over the last 12 months. 
A year ago, next to nobody was using these campaigns because, to quite frankly, they were clunky, they were awkward. And, hey, why would you trust them to um, run a campaign for you when they get paid if you spend more money? But in only a year, that has more than doubled to 8%. And by the end of this year, our estimate is that that's going to be around 20% of all search campaigns. And this is specifically talking about Google search, you know, where you go in and you type your search into the Google engine. That's going to be one fifth of all campaigns, we think, by the end of this year. And we're talking thousands of campaigns. That's the trend we've seen in adoption in the local space over the last 12 months. But here's the key thing. If they only account for currently 8%, then the rest of the search campaigns account for the other 92 currently, which says, great, so Google aren't running 92% of those campaigns, but they are, sort of. In most campaigns now, Google has automated artificial intelligence-based bidding strategies. A year ago, 55% of those campaigns had already switched to smart strategies rather than manual human managed bids. It's now 67%. It looks like it's on track to be 80% by the end of this year. So if Google aren't running the campaign in full for you, they're going to be running the bidding. And in our experience, nine times out of 10, when Google run the bids, they beat what we do. And they're only getting smarter. We can't. 18 months ago, we used to beat them all the time as humans with their bidding strategies. Now we're struggling. They win a lot more than they lose. We've seen the same in shopping. Shopping's already up to 85% smart bidding because when you're dealing with merchant feeds, it's, it's just too much. And here's where it's got really, really interesting. Video bidding. Now, if anyone thinks video isn't for local, hey, you couldn't be more wrong. YouTube ads for local are fantastic. Uh, we'll be having a big focus on them in the, in the later part of this year because they have a huge opportunity and they work. Even in niches where traditional Google search ads don't work, YouTube ads do and they work well. Now, a year ago, January 2020, 51% of YouTube ads had smart bidding. Look at the jump. 82% now are using smart bidding strategies. It will be almost ubiquitous by the end of the year, we suspect, because simply their bidding algorithms do a better job than we do. And the reason is they know more about who that person is on that search page at that moment in time than we do, because they can intelligently say, I believe that you, you should bid X to get this person because they're a really good fit for your business or bid Y because they're not a really good for your, fit for your business. They see it, we don't. They've got thousands of data points that we don't have access to. And if you think it stops there, it doesn't. They're even writing your ads view now. Google now um, are writing ads and such that in the old days, you would write a headline, you would write a description, you'd write a second description, and you'd give it a URL. Can't do that now, but well, you can. But increasingly, and Google's algorithms are favoring their own tools. Um, you write 10 to 15 headlines and a bunch of descriptions, and Google automatically finds what it believes to be the winning combination of those ads. And now they've started even recommending artificial intelligence written headlines and descriptions. So they're writing them for you. So think about that. They're controlling your bidding strategy, so how much you pay per click. They're writing the ads. They're making recommendations every part of the account. And at the same time, they're taking away your visibility and control. They're taking away visibility of search terms, which is key to managing an account properly. If our ideal vision was to have 100% visibility, we never had that. But up until September last year, we had about 75% visibility. Now we only see about 38% of the search terms that are in a campaign. Think what Google are doing. They're taking control and they're removing visibility. At the same time, using a sample size of just under 6,000 keywords, we've seen a 10% uplift in average cost per click across that basket. Prices are going up. It's down a little bit since the peak around Christmas, 
But that's even despite this kind of mini crash when the pandemic first kicked in at the start of 2020. Um, expect that to continue in an upward trend. And at the same time, by the way, they're eating your lunch with local service ads. Google are almost controlled these entirely by algorithm, and they are now sitting above the ads that we all manage and run on a day-to-day -day basis. So that sounds pretty bleak, but it isn't. It means that, A, Google ads are in huge demand, and the returns should get better because fundamentally, the things they roll out, in some respects, they do better than we do. In others, they don't, and that comes to strategy. And that's where we get to play a bigger game. If we analyze data well, if we build strategies, if we add values to our clients, if we help them with follow-up, with positioning, with offers, with creative, then we can do much more value than we can do turning handles, managing bids on a campaign. Think about it. Handle turning is a $10 an hour job. Strategy, follow-up, lead conversion is a $500 an hour job. That's where we get to spend our time going forward. So embrace the robots. Don't fight them. Use them. And if you're on the fence, if you're one of those person managing Google Ads campaigns and you're going, I want to do it the manual way because that's the way I've always done it and I don't trust them and they know they're not here for my benefit, I would urge you to rethink. The days of that being A, possible, and B, successful, are getting smaller every single day. So with that said, Embrace Google Ads, guys. Have fun with them, but add value to your clients. Thanks, Rob. And that, for me, that was really eye-opening for like what's happening in the last 12 months, especially the graphs and, and what you're seeing from September till now uh, for me. But I know, like Mike, you run a, a lot of ads and stuff for your, for your business, your agency and things like that. What did that, how, what resonated with you with, with that? Um, you know, I, I would say for me is just, the big opportunity that all of these platforms provide for all of us that is still so completely underutilized by most of us. I mean, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like I can manage like advertising in one place um, or helping my you know customers advertise in one place when we all know now there's, you know, there's Facebook, there's Google, hey, what's up? There's, um, you know, YouTube, there's LinkedIn, there's so many different places that we could advertise. And thank goodness these platforms are making it, you know, easier on us in many ways and, and using their incredible data so that, you know, we can take advantage of it because there's just, there's so many opportunities. And, and we think about our small business customers and how many of those opportunities they're not yet capitalizing on. It's it's incredible. Lots of upside. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point there. It's really it actually lowers the barrier of entry for newer agencies. There's less to learn, right? Because you've got the, the robots helping with the, at least maybe the first portion of it from there. Alicia, I know you work with a lot of uh, newer agencies as well. You know, how does that resonate with you? Well, first, let me say my favorite slide that Rob had up was the one that said it was like the local ads. And, you know, it was very clear in that it said you just pay when a customer, you know, contacts you. So I really think that for us and my agency, we have been putting Google ads on the back burner when they should be in the forefront. So after Rob's presentation, it's definitely something that I'm now going to say, you know what, we need to be going hard with this. Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we doing it? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, we, everybody should be. As a matter of fact, we're starting you know, Google search ad campaigns here in my office as well, because not necessarily, I haven't seen Rob's presentation before this, but now it's like, man, I was going in the right direction. It kind of reconfirms everything they were doing. I know, Brian, you do a lot uh, as well. Yeah, no, Rob is uh, obviously a complete, I don't want to say math nerd, but a brainiac who I enjoy talking to about the topic. And between he and Troyer, um, man, you'll get all you ever want to know. I, Jeff, I wanted to call out, Rob, I didn't get this from you, but I assume this is okay if I put this up here. A lot of people are asking about Rob and about his company and the PPC work he does. So, Rob, if it was okay, I just put your link up to your website, you guys. Damn it. We've all known Rob for years. Uh, I, I can't say enough good things on my end about about Rob and about his uh, his partner Joe as well. Yeah, that's absolutely. cool. Oh, good, <laughs> good. That's yeah, so a reach out to you guys. Anything, and then uh, Chris, 
I know you're one of our other brainiacs in the group too that talks about like so this the robots and the AI and all that kind of stuff. You know, what do you, what from your perspective, all the smarter guys in the room, what's that? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's like I always enjoy listening to Rob um, when he has something to say because I mean he digs into the numbers and he doesn't. Um, the thing I like about what you talked about today <clears throat> is that it's not emotional; it's all based off of data. And I think that's really important to understand is that when you run campaigns based off of data, you'll you'll have much better. Uh, results and much more consistent results when you when you use the numbers to run your campaign. So, yeah, thanks, Rob. Today I, I was taking notes as you were uh, talking. That was great. That was a, that was a great presentation. And of course, the guy that says embrace the robots has two droids sitting behind him <laughs> in his background. <laughs> I love it. Take, take that as a uh, as, as it just dawned on me as, as I was watching you talk, Rob. So that's some really really great information. And you know it's. Like you talked about, we're opening back up, right? We're, we're emerging out of, I don't know, the hibernation or the, or the rest, however you guys want to look at this, is we're really moving forward with our businesses. And you know, a lot of the agencies have made some pivots and some changes. And you know, some of us had some downtime you know, in 2020 or had to make some really great changes. But you know, a lot of the things for, for you guys is now as they reemerge, you need to have a, a comeback plan for both with your agency and as well as the customers and the businesses that you serve. And that's what Mike Cooch is going to come out here and talk a little bit about right now is, you know, how to have that comeback plan, how to implement it for, for yourself and for your agency. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and hello, everybody. And I hear my video is a little bit grainy, so I apologize for that. Um, maybe maybe it'll clear up. Hopefully it does. But hopefully you can, you can still get the message. And um, hello to those of you who said hi. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, you know, as has already been mentioned, we are starting to see businesses open back up and the economy open back up. And I know we are all thrilled for that. And our customers obviously are, you know, just really, really excited to get back to it. And everybody is hopeful, you know, that this next year is going to be better than this last last year. And um, I, I'm certainly, you know, optimistic about that, counting on that. Um, but what I do want to share, as Jeff mentioned, is that I think that we need to have a plan, a plan for us, but a plan for those small businesses that we're serving to take advantage of this reopening of the economy. And, um, you know, I know many of you probably have studied Dan Kennedy at some point in your career. He was very influential uh, on me early on as I was learning about marketing. And he used to just you know, drill into your head over and over and over again that you had to, you know, you had to be scrappy and and, and fight for every dollar. Um, you know, that that you should you should do everything you could to make sure that your business had the visibility, the attention, uh, the credibility, uh, it, you know, attractive offers, everything that you would want at your business to to get your revenue going. And, and he always talked about how so many small businesses in particular just didn't think that way. They, they thought that they could open the doors and business was going to come back to them or, or you know, pe people were just going to come walking in and buying. And I think that there is a massive risk right now for small businesses that have that mindset. You know, if, if people think that we're just going to go back to normal, um, I think that that is a very, very big risk. Hey, David, um, that could ultimately cost a lot of these businesses, you know, that their business, um, that, that they think that just because the economy is coming back, they're going to be fine. And consumer behavior has changed, right? This pandemic was a catalyst for a lot of things. Consumer behavior has changed in a lot of ways. It's not going to go back. We don't know the full impact of that yet. I'm not a I'm not a you know future teller or anything like that. But I know it has changed just by looking at my own personal habits and, and people around me, um, and it has uh, created an environment where certain businesses, the businesses that have been more on top of this technology and social media and things like that, have an incredible advantage over those that don't. And that gap is going to be really hard to close if businesses don't start closing it immediately when this economy opens back up. So we've got to help them with that plan. I want to give you three specific pieces of advice or uh, strategies in terms of how I think that we can best serve small businesses in making that comeback. The first one is about automation, right? And 
we all know that we should be taking advantage of automation and our, our business customers should be taking advantage of automation. We all know that, you know, in so many ways, we're not doing enough of it and they're not doing enough of it. And in the next handful of months, that's going to be more critical than ever, right? Because a lot of these businesses are now short staffed. They have had to get rid of staff. It's going to be higher, hard to bring staff back and train them and things like that. So you have this period of time where if they're not taking full advantage of automation, then they could lose a lot of opportunities or create bad customer experiences. And it only takes one of those for somebody to be turned off and go away. So I'm talking about just basic upgrades of their tech. I'm not saying that we have to here in the next few weeks put in full automated systems, but we should be doing things like just making sure that they have a mobile optimized website and that their website has the basics on it, right? It's, it's got a phone number, it's got uh, an opt-in form, some sort of lead capture that's clearly visible. Um, and I'm a big fan of that every business should be using some sort of what I call a smart number, but like a Twilio number, a tracking number, um, or something that you can do some auto response features. You know, when somebody misses a call, I'm a big fan of this missed call text back service where if somebody misses a call, we can automatically text them back to say, hey, sorry, we missed your call and try and engage them in a conversation that way. Just any time saver and automation that we can help our small businesses with so that they don't miss out on those opportunities and they don't create the poor customer experiences. And then another one that I would add in there that I just think it's crazy that not every single business is doing and yet most of them are not, is a retargeting campaign, right? Putting in a retargeting campaign into that mix of technology so that we know that in one way or the other, we're following up with all of our opportunities. I think that's a no brainer for every single one of your small business clients, okay? So, so that's one thing is just some of that basic technology, right? Let's make sure that they have a foundation Again, we don't have to get over the top fancy about it with all kinds of you know funnels and all that type of stuff. Yeah, we can just make sure that they have the basics because most of them still need that. Second thing, they have got to build their list, right? How many small businesses right now have no list to market to, to let people know that their doors are open? It's a tragedy how many businesses don't have a list. So we have got to help them build that list. And to me, and I know to many others, I think the first thing that most small businesses should be focused on is SMS, right? Capture those texts, capture the cell phone numbers so that we can text uh, prospects, we can send out offers and things like that. Um, it, you know, 95% open rates. It, it just, it's, it's easy. It's the way more people are doing business now is on their phones, getting texts. Um, you know, I receive a thousand plus emails every day and I read a handful of them. Every text that comes in on my phone gets read and usually immediately. So building a list and building an SMS list, I think should be an absolute priority in your comeback plan for your customers. And then the third thing that I would say, and this is mindset as well as strategy, you've got to help sell them though on this mindset. And that is treating this reopening of the economy like a second grand opening for their business. Having that mindset, you know, if, if you can help them rewind back to the day when they opened their business and that excitement that they had um, and that effort and energy they put into telling everybody to make sure that people, you know, had a, had a reason to come into their business and putting out some exciting offers and things like that and having a plan, having a marketing plan over a period of time, instead of just opening the doors and putting up that big grand opening banner, right? Having a plan where you're actually saying, hey, let's do this in the first week, this in the second week, this in the third week, this in the fourth week, and giving them whatever it is, a four week plan, a six month plan, whatever they can commit to and you can help them with, but getting them to treat this like a new opportunity to, to open a brand new business again, and again, part of that is just mindset, trying to get them to get excited about that opportunity and think strategically rather than just opening their doors. I think if we can do those three things for our small business customers, we're going to have a huge impact on them. You're going to play a critical role in their success, and we're going to play a critical role in the success of our local economies, which I know we all want to do. We're all excited to do here in this next year. So 
That's it. That's the comeback plan. Make sure that they got that basic tech in place, right? Mobile optimized website, lead capture, uh, a smart number, call tracking number, and a retargeting campaign. Build their list, preferably on SMS, and then give them an actual plan of attack to relaunch their business, not just to open the doors and think that, think that things are going to come back to normal. Okay. I hope that helps you guys. And uh, I appreciate your time and attention and being here. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. And I think that's a, a, a brilliant plan, right? A lot of us are thinking at our agency, you know, what do we need to do to be able to help these businesses really with that grand reopening, if you will. It's a great way to frame it and, and put it. And if you take that mental shift and look at it and change the language a little bit to a business owner, you're now not necessarily competing with all the other agencies out there. You're providing something of, of great value to those. So at least I know you're doing some really things to help reinvigorate and do the grand opening as well for, for businesses. So what did you think about what Mike was saying? Well, I one of the things that I, I loved that Mike said that we're all going to quote after this is, you know, treating the reopening of the economy as a grand opening or a re-grand opening for the business. So I thought that that was so spot on. And I also loved when he said, as you're working with them, go into it with like a plan, like a plan of attack. And I could see myself sitting down with local businesses and saying, you know what, we need to go over your plan and your plan of attack. And that being a really great, even foot in the door strategy for attracting new clients saying, Hey, I have, you know, this new service that I have, it's called a plan of attack and your grand reopening. So thanks for that, Mike. It was really great. Yeah. It, it, Thank it you. Absolutely. So, Brian, I know you got, you do some things in your agency as well to help with those businesses with, with packages. Yeah, everything that uh, Mike spoke of, I mean, it's almost like he sits in my office with me. That It is so <laughs> congruent with what we're doing. The list, the simple blocking and tackling, the basics like following up. We do the, uh, we do the automatic text back as well. One of the most useful services, and when Mike hit on it, I'm like, that is the biggest no-brainer in marketing right now. It's not a bulk text. I'm not saying take 8,000 texts and send them out. I'm saying if somebody calls you, and you miss them, you can give them an automatic text back one to one. It is totally compliant. Check with your attorney if you want, but it is the best strategy that gets that conversation started between Mike's client or my client and and the business owner. So it's it's fabulous. So no, I, I love it. it. Honestly, really connected with me today. Yeah, thanks, Brian and, and Chris. From from your perspective, you know, what's the big thing that you saw on your side? You know, I think the big takeaway for me, and thank you, Mike. That was great stuff is building lists and i think back to a couple uh, companies that we are working with specifically restaurants they did not feel like they had a list because they're just people were restaurants but through the pandemic that just did, did not happen and now they were caught with their you know they were caught um, unprepared because they didn't have the ability to go back out and reach out and bring their own back so that um a tactic and a strategy for uh, this coming year which is to build their because now they're feeling the pain. So use you know that's like a great a great foot in the door strategy. Just say, hey, let's not make that same mistake again. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Rob, from from your perspective, I mean, you you come from a little bit different perspective from the from UK from from your side. But I mean, we're all digital agencies helping local businesses, right? Yeah, and I think I think the same applies for everybody in this situation. And the key thing for me right now is service. Business owners are facing a new normal that they've never had to face before and nobody in the previous generation has faced before. It's a whole new normal that will be different depending on your city, the type of business that you're in, a whole bunch of variables. For us as agency owners, that business owner has no map. They have no plan to navigate this new normal. We have a ton of plans, tools, skills, and things that we can help them to navigate, shine a light and show them where to go. And if anybody is slightly even hesitant about being that guide, it's not about sales, it's about being the guide to somebody who really now is lost in a very dark tunnel with no clue how to get out of it. Help them see the light, help them get out and be a positive impact. And you know, as Mike says, it doesn't have to be rocket science. They can do lots of things that are very simple and be of huge service to people right now who you'll be very, very gratefully received. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, you know, Mike, you say uh, time and time again, and I say it's blocking and tackling. You don't need to have this 
magical cosmic plan. It's the basics are, are what work every, every time. So thank you for that. And thank you for sharing and kind of getting the, the comeback plan train out the, out of the gate for a lot of folks that are on here. They seem to like really resonate that really, really well. Oh, you bet. I'm glad. Thank you. So, so now we talk about the comeback plan. Let's talk about what's happening on the social side. We're talking about ads. We're talking about creating that comeback plan. <laughs> I don't know about that one. I'm on here, but uh, you know, let's, well, let's, uh, let's bring it to the social side of this. Right. And there's, some emerging tech. Well, it's not really emerging. It's been around for a while, but like emerging to the small business owners with social commerce. And, and there's a new era of, of retail that's happening right now. We've got Alicia Little representing, you know, that side of it. And she's like our group expert guru when it comes to talking about social and you know, how to sell on, on social. So Alicia, let's talk a little bit about what you guys are doing inside of your agency. Yeah. With you and Sure. I am so excited because we've done something really crazy in our agency. But first, let me back up and say, hi, everybody. I'm Alicia Little, and I'm happy to be here. Last time I was on this State of the Local, I spoke about social commerce, and we talked about the new era of retail. And so my sister, Lorette, and I, we were advising local businesses, and we were advising our our students on how to do this for retail. So, so how to do this social commerce. I'm going to talk about what that means in a minute. But as we're doing this, we were getting so many questions. Like people were asking us all these different questions about how do you do this? How would you do this? What software are you going to use? And guess what? We couldn't answer all the questions. You want to know why? Because we weren't doing it ourselves. So although we were saying, look at this case study and look at this business owner that's doing it, we weren't doing it ourselves. So we challenged ourselves and we said, okay, you know, we got all of our students together and we're like, I know it, this is going to sound crazy, but we said, what if we set up a retail store? So we were going to buy some inventory and learn about retail in the, the most basic way, fundamentals. And then as a retail store, sell our inventory. So we can now teach businesses how to do it. And then our students who work with local businesses can implement it. And now I'm happy to say maybe probably 22 days later, that if you ask me anything about selling retail on a Facebook Live, I can answer any of those questions on what software to use and everything. So we were crazy. We did it. It took a lot of energy, but we set up a new store. I called it Boss Babe Outlets. You can even find it on Facebook and see some of the lives that we did during that time. It was a whole lot of fun. Um, but we set up a retail business in my living room. Now, the people that were buying had no idea that it was just a newly set up business to, you know, to really test and to understand um, social commerce. But we had a lot of fun with the buyers and and their audience, they're, they're awesome. So we set up a new store. We had to create a new audience from scratch. And here's how we did it. Are you guys ready to hear how we did it? So the first thing that we did was we said, okay, we're going to just focus on social and just Facebook. So we set up a Facebook store and we set up a Facebook group. Now I'm sitting here thinking, all right, this is a new retail store with zero customers. How in the world are we going to drive any traffic so that we can test this, right? So the first thing that we did was I paid money to a lady to go live in her Facebook group because I knew that she had great potential buyers. So I just did a little bit of research in different Facebook groups. I'm like, ah, here's a Facebook group with shoppers in it. Those are the ones that I want to buy from the retail store. So what I did was I paid her money. I think it was like $59 to go live in her group. And I did it twice. And I just want to say that one customer from her group has spent over $800 with us. So it's that like a 10 time return for just one customer. But in the, in the 22, 25 days, we have about 520 new customers for this new store, Boss Babe Outlet that we set up. So let's talk about the three things that we learned. So the first thing is that the more times I went live, the more money I made. So I made money every time I went live. And as I started looking at retail stores that were going live, I found retail stores here and there that were going live. And, and here's the thing for us as consultants, it's that retail stores are not doing this. And, and I don't care what type of store it is or what type of local business, it could be retail selling clothing or jewelry, 
Um, I've seen companies selling snowblowers <laughs> that were doing it. I've seen beard oil companies doing it. Chiropractors, a dentist would go live and show teeth whitening. You know what I mean? So any local business can do this. But the more times I went live, the more money that I made. So some retail stores that are doing this really well. I mean, there are retail stores. So I was talking to uh, the sister of a retail store owner and she said her, you know, her sister has a, has a physical store and she was making about $5,000 a month in that physical store. And then she started going live and get this, she's at $300,000 a month right now. They had to get a new store that's bigger, same city, just new store that's bigger. And it wasn't the walk-in traffic. It's the online traffic. It's the people that are watching her via webcam that are buying from 5,000 to 300,000 during COVID time because she goes live. These retail stores that are doing it right, they're going live about three times a day. And now you're saying, but I can't convince any retail store owner to go live three times a day. Do you think the owners are doing it? No, they either have staff members that are doing it or I was watching one retail store. It's a store I'm in Georgia right now, actually here in Georgia. And the girl that came on, she loved being on camera. She couldn't wait for the camera to turn on and she showed all the stuff in the store and they were selling everything and they did an amazing job. And the girl, she was like, by the way, I don't own the store. I don't even work here. I just get paid to come in and sell on this live. And I'm thinking to myself, how many other business owners could do this just by paying somebody $15 an hour to get in front of the camera and sell what they've got in their store? So the, the next thing I learned was really understanding my customers. So the first thing is like going live. More times I was live, the more money I made. Um, but I only went live maybe two times a week just because of, you know, the challenge and what we were doing. But also the next thing is understanding your customers. So one time I went live, I made $3 and 23 cents per minute. Like we calculated it down to the minute. And then another time I went live, it was $11 and 20 cents. And then I got up to $14 and 46 cents a minute. And so what was different between the $3 and the $14 is that I understood what the audience wanted to buy. So as I'm attracting in an audience and I went live in this lady's group and brought her people over, let me tell you the secret to doing that. So I got paid, I paid her, went live in her group. And at the end of the group, like, you know, this is internet marketing. I'm an internet marketer. So it, I had a bunch of stuff left that I showed. And I was like, oh, time ran out. I can't, you know, continue doing this. So why don't we go to my Facebook group for the after party, right? Let's go to my Facebook group for the after party. So everybody came and joined my Facebook group. And then that's how I got a whole bunch of her group members over into my group with her permission. She knew I was doing it and said, go for it. Right. And so they came over into my group. And then in the after party, I finished it off. Right. So as a marketer, I know people want <laughs> what they, you know, you, I left them hanging. I'm like, oh my gosh, all this stuff right here. Don't have enough time. Meet me in my group. Boom. Everybody's over in the group. My team is adding people into the group. And that's how we started off. Um, so I learned what they liked. And then I also focused on the items that I had a higher margin. So also, I never really had very large audiences, but when I made $3.23 a minute, I had 14 people watching me. 11.20 a minute was 80 people watching me, so more people. 14.46 was only 20 people watching me, 14.46 a minute, and I'm always live for an hour to an hour and 20 minutes. Um, but the 14.46 a minute with 28 people, they were really targeted, so I had targeted people watching me. And that I learned was a really um, big thing. And then the last thing I'll say is pay to play. I never ran, ran any ads, so I didn't run ads, but I did pay to be live in someone's Facebook group. And I did use the marketing budget I was going to spend on ads and I gave stuff away. So I'm like, here's a tip to grow a group for shoppers or for, you know, if you're in a local area, but, but here's the thing I like to say about local businesses in retail is that because of the times that we're in now <laughs> stores that take advantage of this, that we're only servicing their local area. They're now, 
you know, national and they're now shipping all over the nation. So I was talking to a store owner who did this and she was in business for like seven years and she never had a customer outside of her, you know, geographical region. And then I talked to her last year, I think it was November, October. And she said that she has shipped to like 32 of the states. And she was so excited about that. And that's all from the power of life. So you attract a new audience and now a bigger audience and your local business has not now gone national. In my case, even global, because I have international shoppers who, who've come in. And then pay to play. There's other Facebook groups. Ask the admin if you can pay to be live in their group. Drive people over to your group. And, and all local businesses can do this. Go live. Sell your service. Um, dentist, show teeth whitening. Um, show the before and after. You know, somebody in the chair. Get somebody that's going to come in and do it. Give away coupons. Tell people on the live to set their appointments right there. Put the link to your calendar and have them set the appointments right there. Listen, this is the new era. A lot of people that are buying from me in our store have said, I do not want to go out this time. This is how I want to shop now. I've changed the way that I shopped. So because consumers are changing the way that they shop, are local businesses changing the way that they sell? Right? And if not, there's an opportunity for all of us to help them. Now, just a side note, for fun, we also did this with our digital courses and we went live on one of our Facebook pages and we sold our digital courses. And so in two lives that were both under an hour, we sold over $5,000 worth of courses. And it was a really good testament um, because somebody asked me and they were like, okay, you proved it that it's fantastic for local business. What is it like for internet marketers and you know people who have courses and stuff so i'm like all right let's go live and test it and we did it was a success as well and we had a lot of fun so go live <laughs> go live go live and remember that if the business owner does not want to go live there's some 25 year old local you know young lady or young man that would love to go live for that business and get paid i hope that you guys enjoyed this i call this the um, social commerce formula. And really, it's about taking advantage of the fact that we are in a new way that consumers are buying. So business owners need to be in the new era of retail and a new way of selling. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks so much. That's, that's awesome, Alicia. And it's a, it's a very like different and, and, and unique perspective of what we're seeing going on. You know, we're, you've had different uh, speakers so far and, and, and yours is unique and it really resonates with a lot of different folks. So there's definitely some opportunities for everybody around here to say, all right, I'm going to pull a little bit from this presentation and, and from that. And I know, Brian, you're coming up here soon. Um, you know, what did you take away from the social commerce? I got to tell you, I have a unique advantage that I've, one, I live near Alicia and she let me sit in the group and come on these lives while she did it. Now I was on as an attendee. It is unbelievable. It's a viral frenzy, like you would imagine with home shopping and what's the other one? Uh, QVC. QVC. Except it's done, you know, from Alicia and her team, right? Direct to the people with one button buys. The techno, the fluidity of like the technology and the way it creates a buying atmosphere. Any local business would be crazy not to do it. And I tried to buy something. I believe Alicia called me out because I didn't set up my profile right. <laughs> I'm talking like, Jeff, I'm talking deals like $500 purses. I don't even like purses, guys. $30, $50. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm in. And I, I watched the frenzy happen for an hour. It was like, bing, bing, bing. It was nonstop sales. Any local business would love it. And I know we didn't have time to go deeper, but Alicia teaches service businesses and all kinds of strategies. Anyway, it, it is one of the more mind blowing things that I've learned in the last 12 months was the whole social commerce concept. Yeah, and, and you guys are surprised. Like you said, the business owner doesn't have to be the person in front of the camera. You don't have to be the person in front of the camera. I mean, not every one of us that's on here right now are, are super comfortable with like, hey, let's just turn on video. You may assume that watching this, but but we're not, right? We stumble our words. We go, we're human, just like everybody else out there. Um, Chris, I know you're you're one for doing a lot of commerce. I see your 3D printer behind you and, and doing things like that. Like, what do you talk about? You know, you talk about social commerce and the things that you're doing. Your what, what you how you look at it. Man, you know, um, this is such a critical point for um, this year for sure, because um, 
Facebook and Instagram have really put, put in some really good tools to allow you to do this pretty simply um, to be able to do this. But the, the two big takeaways are the shift from local to national shift is incredible. I mean, it's something that that a lot of business owners, like Alicia said, um, they've never even really before. And when you understand the psychology behind the buyers and what they want, um, in, in fact, that I wrote this down, um, this is the way I want to shop now. I mean, I think that is so true. And if we can take that and be able to, um, you know, implement these these ideas that Alicia has been about, I think, I mean, you could you could be a hero to these local businesses. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, you know, for being the hero of the local businesses, there's there's a lot of impact that you can have for those folks that you're working with. And, and Joe, I know, you know, welcome. You uh, you could be a hero to some of those local businesses as well. Uh, you know, Joe's joining us talking about, you know, we're talking about the social commerce. And I know you do a lot of that, um, you know, for, for you guys with, you know, working with the small business owners. But this is a little bit of a different angle in the ads and, and what you talk about, Joe. What did, what did you learn from Alicia? Well, I just jumped on. Super excited to be here. Sorry I was a little late. Uh, but I, I love that, like, this This is the year of change, right? Like, so much change has happened. And Alicia, I think you said something really brilliant that, like, uh, somebody's going to be willing to change and kind of roll with the punches and figure it out. If you're talking with a prospect and they're not willing to change and to – to, to go from local to national, like Chris said, somebody else is out there willing to make the change. And those are the people you want to be working with, not the ones that are stuck in the way of the past. We've all seen, unfortunately, like businesses, you know, really hurt by the pandemic, but we've seen businesses that have boomed as well. And most of them I find that have boomed changed in some regard majorly during the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a lot of changes, a lot of different things that you can make as, as you go through as, as we set this up. And, and, and Rob, you know, what did you take from, from what Lisa was saying? So I've, I've got first-hand evidence experience of this locally to me, and this just goes to show it's not even environment-specific. We have a local bacon near us, um, and it's closed um, for obvious reasons. They decided to set up a a um, brownie box subscription and they make that they make their brownies available at 8 p.m on a thursday night it's about two hours from now and at 10 minutes before the hour she will go live open this box and explain each of the brownies that are in this box at 801 she is sold out <laughs> now Rewind to start of last year, she would have been stood with a storefront paying rent on a premises that was uh, that she had to be there at nine o'clock in the morning and keep open till five thirty at night, six days a week. She goes live for ten minutes a week now and sells out. Yep. It's yeah. remarkable. So if that's if that's an example of how you pivot and pivot spectacularly successfully then I fully endorse everything that Elise has just said because it works all day long. It's the, it's the silver lining of the digital economy. It's the, it's the evolution, the adaption, the pivots that have had to be made. And, and one of them is, is, is social commerce and things that are happening. And Mike, you know, you're the king of let's create a plan that's simple and, and, it, and it works. And uh, how do you see this as, as working with some of the local businesses that you're, you know, reintroducing and doing the grand opening with? It's probably a great strategy yeah. for that too. Yeah, Absolutely. well, I mean, when, when she first told me about this strategy, I, I was blown away um, and could just immediately, you know, see, wow, you know, the, the potential impact of this for small businesses. You know, we, we talked about this before that small businesses have really survived or thrived in the past based on two things, right? They have either proximity and convenience, and, you know, so that that is the restaurant that's right down the street from me. So I'm going to go there because it's easy. That's the store that's right down the street from me. So I'm going to go there because it's easy. Or they have something special. You know, we like to shop local because there's that person who who creates something unique and special. And, and that's you don't get that on the Amazons. And the reality is that particularly over the last year, the proximity advantage, the convenience advantage has largely gone away. Right, Amazon is now talking about being able to drop drone, you know, products from drones on your on your patio to deliver stuff. Right, they've got convenience pretty much wrapped up. They've got low price wrapped up. So small businesses have to do something special, which is what they're good at, 
but they also have to be able to get it out to the world. And this is now the way that small businesses have not been able to get it out to the world before. It's like all the barriers have been removed from it. You know, you pick up your phone, you go live on social media, like we're doing right now, and you can reach an audience anywhere and deliver your products anywhere. It just opens up a whole new world of opportunity. And I do think, I mean, any, any business right now that takes advantage of this as part of their reopening and follows the strategies that, you know, Alicia is describing here, it's just, it's a massive opportunity. It can take a huge competitive leap in the marketplace. Yeah, we've talked a lot about different opportunities and different ways to be able to help these businesses pivot or, or work to reopening or to reinvigorate their, their fan base or their business base and have people either come back in or do this ordering. But there's some other options that you guys have, you know, when it comes to finding a pricing model that works for those business owners, because a lot of them aren't willing to do the, the high dollar or they don't, they just don't have it right now or they're not quite fully comfortable and you know it depends on where you're at in the world different states here in, in the u.s and things like that but you know there's something about creating a, a, a potential membership model for for those business and, and brian i know you are really good about that with with your agency it's something you guys are, are tracking uh directly with right now you want to share a little bit about what you're doing with that with the agency business model yeah it'd be great jeff um let me see if i can get this thing working i'm gonna put my timer on jeffrey so <laughs> so awesome all right what we did is immediately lost 35% of all our clients last year. And that was daunting, right? It really was demoralizing. It was daunting. And we were not alone. Um, I realized as I talked to clients I had had for 15 years, and it was like they were, it was like a relationship breaking up. And they didn't want to break up with me. They didn't want to lose that relationship, but they could no longer afford the price point of you know where we were locked in at and what we were doing and it didn't even make sense for some of them in the way they were operating. So, I was forced to basically really dig deep and re-examine what we were doing and how we were going to market and what we charged and what we sold. And what I came up with was my litany of stuff from, you know, 800 bucks to 2500 to 3k, it wasn't working and and it still isn't working today for the vast majority of businesses. So what I had to do is I had to say, what would I buy if I was that business owner right now? What price point would work? What would cause them to continue to purchase from me? And the reality was it was lower. So I had to change how I packaged and how I priced. So what I did is I immediately lowered my prices. I came up with a package, a bundle, if you will, that tied into a membership site, right? So the bundle would give you two or three things for, I'm going to say $300. And then there would be another bundle bundle for four to $500 that would give you more because none of the business owners were quitting on their business. They weren't giving up. They were up against unbelievable odds, right? With the pandemic, with the shutdowns around the world, right? So they didn't want to quit, but they couldn't continue operating. And many still can't in the same way that they did pre pandemic. So how do I reach them without, I, you know, there's only so much I can do for $300, right? There's only so much I can do. I can't, I can't be their best friend, hang out with them, call them every day. It doesn't work like that. There's only so many hours in the day. So I'm thinking, all right, a membership site services that have a high done for you component. And, and I started testing it out in the service niche in air conditioning, heating and air conditioning. And then I started testing it out in two or three other niches. And the reality was I, I did some things that all of you are going to think are very um, unusual in the agency space, yet common in Internet marketing. I kind of realized the same thing that uh, I think it was Rob or Mike pointed out about small businesses being able to go broader and not just be local this convergence of internet marketing strategies with local agency topics. So I offered a $1 trial. And when they did the trial, they were able to pick one of two packages, right? And so one package may have done for you social media, call tracking, and an email marketing tool, right? With templates designed for their image. And they would pay monthly for that. And it would have all kind of, you know, I would send them a report twice a month, but it would be very little handholding. They would get immediate fulfillment. They would be able to log in almost like they bought a course. 
And then I did the same thing with more stuff, addressing all components of what they needed in their business or in my mind, what they needed. So to touch on what Mike said, Mike Cooch, um, one of the things I hit on was customer follow-up, email, re, uh, marketing and reactivation of past customers. I created bundles with solutions that addressed what they really needed. And then I made it sound kind of cool. I didn't just make it sound, you know, a bunch of IM buzzwords. I used the words from their industry. So for instance, if it was a heating and air company, I talked about uh, service plans, right? Annual maintenance plans are very critical for a recurring revenue stream. Um, I talked about new install clients. I talked about repair clients, but I then using the AC company's words in this example, rolled in different products and services that we all have and sell. And I created these two price points. Now the beauty is I, I created a model where most of the work is done once, like with a setup. So if I put a call tracking widget, let's say on their website, it's, you know, I got to do something once for a few minutes and then I'm able to send them a report on a regular basis. So they feel like they're getting value for the money. If I'm using a, uh, if I'm using a done for you social media service, right? And I'm giving them a presence. Um, many years ago, I remember Mike said something to me that stuck. Uh, Mike said, Brian, I love the focus on activity based, not results. And this is, I don't know, five, 10 years ago. And he's right. So by delivering these activity based services in a way that takes you out of the fulfillment equation, right? And you price it in a way they can afford and you give them a tripwire for a dollar to come on board with a trial, you would be surprised how many clients you can sell. Um, and it's a beautiful thing because they don't, they weren't giving up on me. They were giving up on price points and things they could no longer afford. And they were reinventing their bakery to Rob's point, right? They, they were reinventing everything about their business and trying to ad adapt during this crisis so I had to change how we went to marketing. Now, how did we get the clients? Obviously, that's the key part. So two strategies we've been using. We use email combined with voice and text, right? That goes to a sales page. So the email, like if I pick a bunch of, you guys all have tools that probably can email and can find a certain niche. So let's say I was doing auto repair shops and I got a bunch of auto repair shops. I then created emails that were designed to speak to the auto repair shop. The copy was designed to get them to click. And when they went to the page, it wasn't my normal website. It was a sales page for an auto repair shop buying a bundle of marketing. And they could start for $1. Guys, the $1 thing with a local business speaking their language really, really resonated. It worked very well. Um, now, why the sales page? One, depending on where I was working, I couldn't meet the person. I didn't, at this price point, I wanted something that could scale and didn't require me to spend a lot of time with them. And I knew it worked um, from internet marketing. I knew it would work well. And it, and it carried over exactly how you guys would imagine. High percentage of people take the $1 trial. Not all of them go through. You may find 40 to 50% of the trials stick. But imagine your, imagine this. You get 18 trials one week and nine of them rebuild. So on Monday, you had zero clients, but on Friday, you have nine clients. Now, I want you to imagine slowly scaling that each week. And instead of carrying a heavy fulfillment burden by using uh, done for you, SaaS products, um, all those, all the kind of strategies we know, you can alleviate the fulfillment burden making it really attractive for the business owner without putting you in the, the driver's seat, so to speak, without really creating a burden for you. Now, that was one way we got clients. Um, Lee Waters asked me, how long was the dollar trial? And Lee, I've tested this a million times. There's no right answer, but seven days is the one that I always go with because I find that the numbers are the same and I'd rather find the fastest route to the cash rather than wait a month. So seven days works. Sign up rate was no better at seven or excuse me, no worse at seven than it was at 14. I wasn't willing to do 30. So the seven was the one I stuck with. So um, let me let me take the next point. So that was one way I got clients. Now, the second way, some of you are going to go, no way. 
And a lot of you are going to go, oh, I could do that. All right. The second way I got clients is I took a presentation. Now, straight up, this presentation was several years old. I changed the background and a few slides to make it look more modern. And I did a presentation to a local group. Think uh, chamber, uh, think board of realtors. Um, let me give you another one. Think local bar association. Um, if you want to get crazy, if you guys are hardcore, think uh, supply houses where the service companies buy their parts and you're doing a lunch and learn for their people. Look, at the end of the day, the service, the supply house just wants the AC guys to sell more so they can buy more from them. All I did is a 40 minute presentation, 40 minutes. And then I answered questions. And now the key part of this is I gave away a free audit or, or a free gift, right? And you can change it to be what you want. In this case, it was something I could run on a simple software tool from another member of our group. And, and that was it. So imagine if you had 60 people from the chamber watching your presentation via Zoom. You're not meeting anybody. You're not selling. You're not uncomfortable. You're really just reading some slides and adding a little color commentary. And out of 60, you got 30 or 40 of them that did the not a trial. They did the free gift. So back to Mike and kind of what I'm doing as well is now you've got all these inbound leads, these opt-ins from people that have raised their hand and said, hey, think I might be interested in that exact thing. And now you can follow up. Some of them are going to hunt you down and want to sign up. And others, you just put in a, a follow-up nurture campaign. And it takes a couple times, except you're not talking to them. You're routing them to the sales page where they can try it for a dollar. So with that, I, I my own timer went off. So I'm going to take myself out of uh, the solo mode. Let me see if I can come back. Jeff, here yeah. we go. You're good. Awesome. And yeah, there's, that's, I mean, that's a great model. Again, uh, being creative in a time of, you know, need for, for some of these businesses where you're offering them something. And a couple of things I took away from it was, you know, consider reframing your offers to so something that's niche specific. The language is focused specifically to them and you're talking directly to them uh, for yourself. And then, you know, that risk-free trial, the dollar trial, you're right. About half of them will uh, rebuild, you know, plus or minus five to 10%. And, and, but that's good. Right? You're going to weed out the ones that, that don't make it uh, from there. But I think the most important thing about everything you said is it's low bandwidth fulfillment. Right, You don't need a lot of your own bandwidth. You can keep selling because of the way you've built that, that out from there. Jeff, think so, about this. Less yeah. than 20 hours a week in the agency over seven figures. Less yeah. than 20 hours a week of actual work. I'm talking follow-up. I'm talking fulfillment. I'm talking everything. Now, I have, I have help, but my personal involvement is 100% less than 20 hours. So if that's attractive, think about pivoting on your model. And, and that's a, a good takeaway for you guys. Yeah, we've, we've had some really different variations of what works. So there isn't just one thing you have to do. And I think a lot of folks that are on this call, if you're watching this and you're going through, maybe watching on, on a replay, like pick the one that resonates really well with you. And, you know, we've got an expert of, uh, that come out for each every one of these topics because they are the experts in those. So Chris, what did you think about a little bit about what Brian said with, with his agency model? I know you've heard a little bit about it uh, before in the past. Yeah. You know, um, the two big takeaways and, and thanks Brian for sharing that stuff. It's funny cause I've known you for a long time, but every time that you talk, I'm taking notes because the, what you come up with is just so genius. And the two things that I came away with that I'm going to um, try to implement on my side, is the ability to give customer, it, basically taking um, local marketing strategies for selling and applying them to local businesses. And the two that I took away were, give the customer two different options. I've never done that before. And I think that's genius because it allows the customer to feel like they're in control of what type of marketing that they have. And um, and also to um, to do bundles, um, like two yeah, different bundles. types of bundles kind of a thing. So that, that is awesome. Such a, so a simple thing to do, but I mean, obviously there's tremendous results from that. Yeah. Joe, what did you, uh, what did you pull from what Brian was talking about with this agency model? I know we talk about it a lot as a group. I really look like how you took like this, this membership model. That's more of a online or affiliate marketing model, this digital model and how you applied it to what we would call like an offline niche or a local niche. I think like just transitioning that is so key. And I think that um, there's a huge trend in being able to do that, right? Alicia was talking about basically doing the same thing and, and taking it back to local. So the trend that I keep seeing just being here for a short amount of time is taking what 
you see people doing in na national businesses and, and digital businesses and product-based businesses and applying them to a local level. And I just think it's it's super, super smart. Yeah, and it is, it is, it's a great strategy. It's, it's super smart the way it works out and how the whole thing like kind of pieces together. And, and Rob, I know uh, you in, in, in general have a, things in your own businesses together and things like that, but you also have the separate stuff like the agency model. What does that resonate for you for what you guys are doing? For me, the key thing is risk. Think about the time that we're living in right now. Business owners have had a hell of a year. They are in many cases cash poor, they are confused. Um, and they need, but they still need help. And many of them have already had previous bad experiences or no experience at all. So their perception of what an agency can bring to them is at best a little jaded or unaware. And yet we as agency owners go, hey, I've got this great service for you. And it's good news. I can give you a discounted onboarding fee of only $2,000 today. And they're like, no, 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 no. That's not the game we're in today. Brian's flipped it on the head, takes the risk, makes it easy to say yes, and then and only then after delivering some value, ask for an ongoing payment that's appropriate and reflects the level of service given. That totally changes the dynamic when you're late. It's, it's like rolling out the red carpet versus asking someone to smash the door down to get in. It's a different model and it's a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree 100%. Mike, what do you think? Um, well, you know, Brian mentioned some of our conversations that we had years ago, like uh, activities versus results and things like that. And I, I'm just a huge fan of those types of models. I mean, people who are familiar with me in my community will hear me say that I, I actually hate to use the word agency. I, I try and get people to to think of what what I call to as a what I call as a marketing services provider instead. And it's just a small little shift in language, but the mindset is that, hey, we can deliver a lot of value to our customers without having to do any sort of agency types of services. There are lots of other ways to add value, tools, training, membership, community. There's all these things that have a lot of leverage to them um, that Brian has packaged up in this, you know, this awesome offer that obviously really speaks to the small businesses now because they're looking for things that are more affordable and give them, you know, still good upside, uh, but have that lower price tag. And he's saying, well, I'd love to offer some things at a lower price tag and recurring revenue and don't require me to, you know, have to have to sit there and do anything to fulfill all day long too. So it, it's a win-win. I love it. Yeah. I think Lisa, you can talk to like, this could actually be melded to what you were talking about earlier too. Like there's a good hybrid of that. Yeah, absolutely. And there's one thing that Brian talked about as, as I was taking notes, I was like circling that. And he talked about how he used a presentation and did it for a local group. And I'm thinking that right now in the times that we're in, Chamber of Commerce, they must be like fiending for someone who's got some good content to come present to their groups on Zoom. So, you know, they, I know they would love to do these Zoom presentations. So that's the one thing that I wrote down, Brian, that I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna take a presentation and contact local chamber of commerce and say, I have something that can help your members and and pull them in that way. So I loved how you said, you know what? I just took an old presentation and updated a little bit and did it. Well, I'll okay. send you mine, Alicia, and you just kind of infuse your special sauce, but Even it'll, yeah, it'll be <laughs> easier. Just cut and paste a few things, add it, and it'll be amazing. I love That's that awesome. part. So yeah. <laughs> That's a great idea. All right, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, you know, we, we've gone from, you know, Hey, yeah, you talking about the agency model. You talk about social, but there's there's a lot of trends that are happening right now with, with with social media. And Chris, I know you're our resident expert on you know social media and, and, and trends uh, on what's happening. You want to tell a little about what you're seeing in, in 2021 and what's happening so far with uh, with social media and marketing using that as a platform. Yep, you bet. Thanks, Jeff. And um, it's so great to be with you guys, my friends, my fellow digital marketers, fellow entrepreneurs, and you know certainly last year. Um, has presented us with some challenges to say the least, but you know, with these challenges also come opportunities. And that's what uh, we're all here today to talk about, you know, all different aspects of how we can change. And today I'm gonna to be talking about social media. And <clears throat> I think that when uh, I've completed my thoughts today in the next 10 minutes or so, that you're gonna have a greater understanding of place that social media may have for you during this next year. 
And you know, for some, it's going to be getting right back to the same struggle that you've always been doing. And for others, these things that we've all learned today um, are going to allow you to make some changes that will ultimately make 2021 a great year for your business. And you know, this digital marketing industry is taking the world by storm. As businesses get back to work, people are getting immunized. You know, feeling more comfortable going back into restaurants, into stores, and businesses, things like that. And as these businesses regain their position in the community, it's going to require more than hard work and capital investments by these businesses. It's going to require getting the world to see that they exist and that they are open. And this is where you come in. And today we're going to go over one of the most fundamental ways of doing this, which is social media. Um, you know, social media, it's the benchmark of a company. It introduces the company, it defines the company to the public, and it plays a role of information, education, and support with these businesses. And it supports every other type of marketing and every type of marketing supports social media. So it's very intrinsic to everything that, that uh, we as marketers do. And in 2020, uh, we saw a remarkable surge in social media usage with millions of people suddenly sheltering in place and working from home. And according to Statistica, um, the average time spent on social media grew to 145 minutes per day per person. That's two and a half day or two and a half hours per day that you have an opportunity to be in front of them. And this is a massive amount of time spent on social media. And really what it does is it creates a massive opportunity for you. And um, Facebook claims that they have 2.8 billion people that use Facebook every month. These are the people that log in and use their software. And so, you know, that being said with some of the demographic changes in Facebook's have also changed. And so basically with um, the, the demographics being more older on Facebook have really changed and in 2020, um, the largest segment now on Facebook is between the age of 25 and 34. Now we, we typically seen this on Instagram as being the one that's, that has the younger generations, but now Facebook has gotten this big resurgence of, um, 25 to 34 year olds. And so the majority of these users are tech savvy. They, they access uh, social media through their mobile devices and stacks up to capitalize on all these opportunities as a member of the digital marketing community. And it's our job as digital marketers to recognize these opportunities for these businesses and um, recognize their pains that they're feeling that we've talked about in different areas today, and then also to provide their solutions. So what I wanted to do is talk about some trends that may help you better understand the landscape of social media for this year. And so the first trend that I wanna talk about is the trend that older people are becoming more tech savvy. So right now, 20% of the entire American population are baby boomers. That's one out of every five of us is a baby boomer. And so, and it's estimated that um, about 70% of these baby boomer, boomers are older than 55, that they bought something online in the last 30 days. And then over half of them discovered new products using social media according to some polls that were out there. Now, this is a massive amount of purchasing that's originating from social media, more than has ever happened before. So um, this trend um, kind of shows us that we shouldn't be overlooking social media with our clients this year. And you know, it may turn out to be substantially more important in your business than you might think, and it may be more important in their businesses than they might think. And so what does it mean that the older population is getting more tech savvy? Like really what that means is that there's a larger population in general that's turning to social media to learn about and buy products. So this leads us to trend number two, which is the rise of social commerce. Now, Alicia, she talked, she talked about some super cool strategies. And, um, but one thing is that 55% of all people online purchased products through social media in 2020. Not a big surprise um, because, you know, when the pandemic hit, you know, everybody kind of turned to the internet to buy things, to have, uh, to have them delivered and things like that. But 80% or 87% of those purchasers claim that social media helped them make that buying decision. And so more people are shopping online than ever. They like it. It's convenient. We've become accustomed to it over the last year. 
And so it's not a big surprise when you can't go out and purchase something, you turn to the internet. So businesses that are poised for this are going to reap the rewards. Just like we heard from Alicia and, and others about how the, um, the, um, the social uh, purchasing is happening. And basically Facebook and Instagram, they've really led the way by introducing all these e-commerce tools within their platform and businesses to help or to help businesses, um, um, you know, sell online like they've never done before. So trend number three is that video is growing faster than ever in 2021. Now video has always been awesome. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to say like, oh, video is like the new thing. It's not, but it is more important than ever because people, I mean, they just, we all love to be edutained, right? We've all kind of heard that before. And that um, statistics show that four times as many people prefer watching YouTube than non-video platforms. People love to watch or YouTube, I do. And so my personal behavior really mimics 68% of all users, which is that I turn to YouTube to watch other people's reviews and stuff before um, purchasing, purchasing a product. In fact, just last week, I was looking for a knife sharpener for my kitchen knives. I was you know, preparing dinner and I'm just like, man, I need a, a knife sharpener. I just didn't have one. And so what I did is I, I looked around and I did some research and then I immediately went to YouTube to find out what other people thought about this knife sharp, sharpener because I didn't want to buy more, um, you know, more than one. I didn't want to buy one that didn't work well, right? So I found um, that other people liked a different type of knife sharpener and I ended up buying a very specific type of sharp, sharpener based on their reviews. And so, um, you know, it, it just works. I mean, that's kind of what we do, right? And so being in a position where you have those videos that are out there um, can put you in a very good position. And another thing about video is that um, about half of all video watchers prefer videos that are six to eight minutes long. So you don't want to be too brief and you don't want to be too long. Some are like kind of right in the middle, right? Like the, the three bears, just right. And um, one last tip for video on social media is that you need to start your videos off strong. You have eight seconds, statistically speaking, to capture your audience before they click away and go somewhere else, right? Um, and just as a point of um, reference, that's only one second longer than the attention span of a goldfish, if that says anything about people, right? But anyway, um, hook them early in the video so that you don't lose those precious goldfish. Trend number four, is that social conversations are becoming extremely popular. Um, basically, 50% of internet users find education, entertainment, and funny videos on social media. And so they, that's why they go there. Um, it's interesting. Uh, there's good dialogue. There's good videos. But 68% of the people that are out there, they think that companies' videos are boring and that they suck. Also that the conversations that they have are boring and they suck and they create social media conversations and videos um, that people just don't want to watch. And so it's our job as marketers to go change that trend and to bring interest and, um, and you know, interesting things to people. So here's a quick suggestion. If you're looking for ideas on how to present um, your product or your service or whatever, go to a local comedy club. You know those improv comedy clubs, you know? Hire those guys to brainstorm with you on how to deliver your story or your video in an interesting and captivating way. And guess what? They're probably not busy right now, if you know what I mean, right? They're probably not having shows right now. So work with them and let them use their superpowers of creativity to help you construct your stories, your videos, and all the different things that you do for your clients. Um, so, you know, just be optimistic. Avoid lashing out at your competition. You know, stay real positive because that's what everybody needs right now, and you will um, win the hearts of your people. So, just as a quick um, recap, right here, um, social media is more important than ever to sell stuff online. Um, older populations are getting more tech savvy, so the population is getting bigger. Um, old, you know, older people, the older generations, baby boomers, they're buying stuff online. Um, so, social commerce is kind of an integral you know, piece of, of um, selling online today. Um, use good video to promote your products, educate, entertain, and sell them using video. And then use social conversations to engage your audience, keep them coming back for more and make them want to like your business to, um, to follow you and, um, 
you know, to follow your fan pages to come back for more. And so just to kind of wrap this up, when we take the time to master our craft as digital marketers, um, the world is a better place. Problems are solved. People are happier. We have the ability to shape and change the world as it's evolving around us. And as we forge ahead in this heavily digitized time, um, you know, marketers, you know, you know, we will either succeed or fail. And it, it all depends on how we're going to shift our businesses this year. Brian talked about many of these guys talked about how we have to be able to change and uh, with the market or we're just going to be kind of doing the same thing we did before, which is old and boring and it's not going to work. So here is a couple of parting suggestions. One, make a strong effort to just take one of us today, a valiant effort to make some your business help shape you into a more successful business for one your clients better and reward loyalty and also learn to understand the change of technology um, so that you can stay ahead of the curve you know don't be afraid to reposition yourself um, with your marketing strategies you know it can be uncomfortable sometimes um, to make these changes but you know you know, make these changes as painful as it might be and consider using social media to further the goals of your customers and yourself. And so anyway, thanks for having me on today. That's all that I have. And uh, it's been great to be with you guys. Awesome, Chris. Thank you so much. And, and those are some great pointers. And, you know, to make sure we keep the attention of all the people on me, I'll keep it to less than eight or 10 seconds uh, as, as I do my part. Joe, what did you take from, uh, from what Chris was saying with, uh, with the trends of what's happening with social media? Man, so so much good stuff. Um, but I wrote down one thing that was was just awesome, Chris. You talked about how people want to see good content. They want to see good ads, ads that they can engage with, right? Uh, and and your tip for going to a local comedy club and hiring a comedian that <laughs> probably doesn't have a whole lot of work right now, I thought was just freaking brilliant. Um, and I guess to like maybe cement your point. Um, we've been playing with some Facebook ads and really focusing on uh, messages that people want. And, and in one market, we went from $8 cost per clicks and $16 leads uh, to $1.75 opt-ins. And the difference was the content, was the ad, was the creative. And so, man, I think you just nailed that. And um, I know that that's a big focus for us is really nailing that content. And so I'm definitely going to be taking you up on that on that tip. Thank you, man. Yeah, you betcha. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great one uh, from there. Rob, what did you take from uh, what Chris was saying? I know you can blend that into some of the stuff that you guys are doing with your uh, with your company. Well, exactly. Uh, and that, Joe's, Joe's nailed it. It's about the content. Um, I I have an, there's an insurance company in the UK. Now, who here ever cares about insurance on Facebook? Especially life insurance. Who wants to buy life insurance? I have never seen a Facebook ad get as many likes and shares as this life insurance ads do because they are brilliantly funny. They are engaging. They make light out of a difficult situation. But if anyone wants to go check out Dead Happy, it's called, and they allow me to do things like, for example, allow $10,000 of your um, you know, life insurance payout to pay for a marching band to, pay, to parade through your hometown you know, for your funeral or to send your friends on a party holiday to the beach. So you can do, they've made something that nobody wants to talk about, let alone watch on the Facebook feed into something entertaining to be shared and engage with. Um, and it's about the personality. And Chris, the other thing, Chris, that's so right is this, shifting demographic where we now i don't go see my family at the moment i zoom call my family for dinner i have zoom dinners with my family members a different generation now participating in a digital economy and it's our responsibility to help our partners and clients and customers reach them because we've got the skills and tools to do it so let's bring them and help them do it i can only imagine what that that graph looks like of the number of folks that become more digital savvy or like educated over the last year because you, you've, you've had to. And, and I know, uh, Mike, some of the things that you do, you know, with your daughters and, and with life and, and your business and things like that, like everybody becomes more digital savvy, like your mother, like being able to reach out to Mama Cooch and things like that. So she has a shout out on our broadcast. Uh, you know, like it's, 
the folks that are being able to become more and more digital savvy and, and we're kind of forced to, that plays into some of the strategies that are out there, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as we were saying, this this pandemic was a catalyst for a lot of a lot of change. A lot of people had to come online for you know they had they now had new reasons and new incentives that they didn't have before. So they're they're on there using it uh, more than ever. And um, you know, as Chris said at the beginning of his presentation, I mean, social media is now how a business's reputation is is established and maintained you know it, it is our perception of the business in so many cases it's it's what you know we we see and we hear from it it's all on social media that's where we engage you know all day every day and so you know i know here in san diego um you know through my business we work with a lot of restaurants and and a lot of bars and things like that here in San Diego, that whole hospitality industry. And it's the businesses that are building that presence on Instagram in particular. Instagram, to me, in the in the real local markets, that's where it's all happening. Um, but those businesses that know how to, you know, share their the right image and, and their message and um, connect with their audience on Instagram are just... You know, dominating the the market, um, it, it's everything. So yeah, it's um, definitely. I mean, we're right on point. Businesses have to be on top of this. Absolutely. Sorry, I had a mute button for a second. So uh, you know, Alicia, for for you, um, you know, obviously being social media savvy uh, with yourself, I mean, those ten trends tend to line up with what you're seeing on, on your side. Absolutely. And the one thing that he said that I really was like, oh, you know, kind of an aha moment was the baby boomers that are coming on that might not have been on before. Because I noticed in in our challenge and when I went live and created the store that we have a lot of baby boomers <laughs> buying from us. And, you know, I just thought that it was very interesting. And a lot of them said that this is the first time I'm buying something or I'm new to the whole shopping online, but they were ready and they had money to spend. So I've really enjoyed that whole baby boomer niche, um, niche, Chris. And then also, you know, you were talking about video and I'm, you know, thinking about what we're doing for local business and we're definitely not taking advantage of YouTube. So another check mark for you know something rob was like google ads i'm like check mark and then you were talking about video i'm like okay youtube need to really get on that yeah youtube's huge right now especially you know people are consuming that it's been the highest consumed media for for almost a decade if not more now with a lot of yeah. different things for that so brian why don't you take a little bit uh from from chris's presentation um for for you guys what you guys are doing yeah the uh the aging of the buyer, right? So talking about the baby boomer um, now coming on what Alicia just said was my biggest one because I don't often think of that. I think of my mom calling me, asking me how to resize a window sometimes on her on her phone or her laptop. But the reality is it's very true. And as a segment that's underserved, it's, it's really easy. So depending on who your clients are, it's really easy to target that market. It's less expensive. You can be... Uh, very specific, intentional, you know, in your targeting, especially if you're doing paid traffic. Um, I love it. I've, I, I have a story. It's not about me, but uh, I was on that Clubhouse app earlier this year uh, a little bit, and I met a guy, a guy, I think the kid's 19 or 20, right? So get this. He is on, um, what's the short one? Oh, my, not Snapchat, the other one. Somebody help me out. TikTok. Uh, TikTok. TikTok. He is on TikTok doing local for pressure washing with 2 million plus view. I'll, I'll share them with you guys. 2 million plus views on some of his stuff. Creative video, I think Chris said, right? It was really compelling video. If you told me I would watch 15 or 20 pressure washing TikToks on my daughter's phone, I'd be like, no way. And he is making an unbelievable amount of money as a, let's call him a social media strategist doing this TikTok based video marketing for local clients. So, so brilliant. I'd never seen anything like it. Very organic. He just started doing it for himself. He lives with his parents. He does it on the side. He's a big TikToker. It took off. Somebody said, well, can you do it for me? So Chris, you're spot on. I, I love the presentation. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Cool. Thank you, Brian. So now let's talk a little bit about like creating their future for the next year. 
go for it. And, and we've got, you know, vice president of our, of our group, Joe Troy, is going to talk a little bit about, you know, creating content, how to create something that you can leverage for the next 52 weeks. Because, right, we, we're about one year into this. We're, we're coming out of the back end, you know, uh, is what we're looking at, you know, is the light, you know, the regrowth, the rebirth of a lot of these businesses. We talked about prepping them for the future, having the right strategies in place, how it ties into paid ads and, and social media. But let's talk about, like, follow up with their customers and things like that. So, Joe, you've got a strategy in place for, like, the next 52 weeks for these businesses that should only take about a day to, to actually implement uh, for, for these agencies. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So super excited to be here. Happy to share with you guys. Um, you know, for me so far, the takeaways have been there's there's a lot of shifting happening, a lot of pivoting, a lot of restructuring of offers, taking what used to be kind of online strategies and, and there's a gold mine to be made in taking them offline um, and really adjusting to what I would call are the new buyer habits, which have really been fast forwarded during the pandemic, right? So like we talked about like, you know, going live on Facebook and I'm just setting a little timer here so I don't run over, um, you know, sending SMS. Uh, but, but what about email, right? So um, email still does really, really well and is very underserved. I'm going to be sharing with you guys how literally I wrote 52 weeks of content emails in less than 24 hours. And we're going to get a little tactical. I'm going to share with you guys exactly how I did it and how you guys can do it too. Um, and I want to show you guys how you can go and you can do this for your clients uh, so that they can stay top of mind and they can stay in front of their, their audience and in front of their prospect. So when that person is ready to buy, uh, that they're on, uh, on the forefront of their mind. So um, at the end of the day, the reason that I think most people don't do email and why I haven't in my agency and why probably you guys haven't wrote, wrote a bunch of content emails in your own agency is because you're always focused on new prospects and, and getting sales out of those prospects and then you know getting in, into fulfillment mode. Um, and really um, the problem is, is you know, we leave behind most of our prospects, right? Most of our budget, most of our marketing is just wasted. It's, it's lost opportunity because we don't make the most out of the leads that we get. So I'm gonna share with you guys are just a really stupid, simple five-step process where you guys can literally create 52 weeks of content emails uh, in less than 24 hours for yourself and for your clients. And obviously the goal of doing this is, is building authority, building trust, staying top of mind. Uh, and so that you're really in the fore forefront and at the right place at the right time um, in that buyer's journey for your prospect uh, or your customers and their customers. And I think at the end of the day, it's really easy to write like one email, right? Getting that past that hurdle and, and sending it isn't that hard, but really like having a system to do it and sending out emails every week, uh, that's hard, right? The reason why nobody really does it either is like you got you got left brain and you got right brain, right? Uh, creating valuable content sucks, right? Uh, creating it with consistency is like a battle of right brain versus left brain. When you, when you really got you know your left brain, the, the logical, planned and orderly side saying, yeah, we got to write all these emails and we got to get them scheduled out. Uh, trying to work with and battling your right brain, which is the emotional and the creative side. And those two don't mesh very well. So it's no wonder it doesn't work that well. Um, I'm going to give you guys a stupid, simple system. Again, just five steps that you guys can use right away to do this, all right? So step one is to simply break down the types of emails into categories of topics that you want to send out. So for me, the way that I do these and the way that I recommend people do these is just their content emails. And then in the bottom, you put a PS that is all about, you know, the, the conversion, right? Uh, oh, hey, by the way, you know, if you're a local business that sells bikes, oh, hey, by the way, we have these three bikes on closeout this week. Uh, if, if you want them, they're 50% off, right? Uh, use it to blow out inventory locally. If you're selling memberships like Brian, oh, hey, wait, uh, don't forget we're running a special on the membership this week, all right? Um, so... For category ideas, you can really talk about anything. And a lot of you guys are probably thinking really tactical about um, whatever topic it is. Let's say that you want to write content for your agency to send out to your prospects that you don't convert or the ones that you do. You're probably thinking like, I got to talk about marketing content. I got to talk 
talk about tactics and strategies. I got to talk about reputation and social and everything else. Um, and I got to share a little bit of a discovery with you guys. Um, in our agency, the emails that do best are not those emails. The emails that get open the best, gets the highest reply rates are all kind of personal things. So just some ideas for you guys. Uh, phone apps, computer apps, SaaS apps, books, automations, right? Things you like, electronics, your your workout, your health, training you enjoyed um, for, for people like you guys, right? Tips and tricks in, in WordPress, uh, takeaways and aha moments we had, sharing a case study, uh, a podcast that you enjoyed or you listened to, uh, you know, YouTube video that you enjoyed or you listened to, a course you purchased and that you liked, uh, marketing tactics. It can really be about anything. But the, the key is to really create four different types of topics that you can write about. All right. So then once you have that, step number two is to come up with 52 total. 52, 52, I don't know, uh, total ideas and break that apart um, and divide that into your four different category ideas. So you should basically come up with 13 ideas for each of the categories, right? So the way that I did this, really stupid, simple, take out a piece of paper, right? Draw a line vertically down the center, draw a line horizontally across the center and just break out your categories and don't spend any time on this. Like take two minutes, and just make it a drill and how fast you can do it, right? Don't think twice, just write it all out, okay? And, and literally a couple of minutes, you're gonna create all the topics and all the categories that you guys are gonna be able to write about and send emails out in, in just minutes, okay? So step three then is uh, really simple. You just wanna come up with a template of how you're going to actually send the emails. like. What's going to be in the body? What's going to be in the subject? Is it going to be funny? Is it going to be like matter of fact? Are you just going to say best and then whatever it is, right? Um, are you going to include an image, right? So if I'm going to recommend something, am I going to put in a picture of it? To do YouTube video, am I going to have a picture? Um, tip for you guys, I find that uh, whenever I can put an image in my emails, not a bunch of images, not 30 images, right? When I can put one, that's whatever it is that I'm talking about. I definitely get much higher click-through rates. So definitely put an image if it's appropriate in there, right? And then do you wanna have it short form or long form? So we did this at Invisible PPC and um, Rob did 26 topics, I did 26 topics and we automated it for the year. A lot of you guys have probably gotten that content and, and it's gone gangbusters. The thing that we've done that's gotten the most responses of any emails that we've ever sent is always that. Um, and so you want to make an email template. But for me, guys, if you get my emails, you know, I'm very matter of fact, I'm very blunt. I'm like, this is the problem that it solves. Or here's the problem I got. Here's how I solve it. Check it out. Right? That's it. Rob is much more long winded, right? Rob will go into an explanation. I can't get into that level of detail. It would take me hours. Rob, it's like, boom, two minutes later, he's done. So just figure out what you want the email to look like, right? Um, and then step number four, this is optional, but I'd highly suggest just organizing it in a Google Sheet. And the way that I do that is just put in the category, right? The topic, then the subject line. Then if I were you, I would break it down into problem and then solution and then a link, right? And so uh, the last step, step number five is to schedule. Okay, so you want this to be consistent. You want people to look for these emails. You want to take your tribe, your customer's tribe, and you want to get them opening your emails at the same time every day of the week, right? If that's three times a week, one day a week, you want them looking out for that email. I send a personal email to my personal email list at Digital Triggers um, every Sunday. And the reason I send it on Sunday is because I never used to send anything on Sundays. So if I'm doing a promotion or anything else, Sunday was always open. So that's when I send out this email, right? Um, and at the same time, every Sunday it goes out like clockwork and I have a core group of subscribers that every Sunday literally open that message. And we only send it to people that are engaged with us and we have about an 80% open rate on that email. Okay, guys, if I need to sell something or if I need to move some units, I get hit with a tax bill I didn't expect, right? How easy do you think it is for me to generate revenue 
like on demand. All right. So look at your schedule, look at your client schedule, whoever you're helping set this up and pick a day of the week that doesn't conflict with everything else. And that also sets you up for success. Okay. And then last step is to literally schedule this all out. So when I do this in my businesses and the businesses that I work in, I do this and I schedule it out for the year and I don't, don't think about it, right? So I go through, when we did this at Invisible PPC, I spent about 90 minutes on the entire project, scoping out all of the content and then coming up with the instructions. I handed it off to a VA and a VA literally wrote all the emails and scheduled it out. It took me about 90 minutes, okay, is my secret. So use this. And don't forget to throw in some PSs that have some promotions in them so you can generate some revenue uh, for yourself and for your clients. Hope that was helpful for you guys. That's awesome, Joe. And I think that's a great way to, to cap off what we've been talking about for the last hour and a half or so is, is really, you know, opportunities and what's happening, seeing the vision of the trends, everything, and then different ways to pivot and shift and finding that model uh, for your agency and your business and then how to plan moving long term from there. So there's a lot of value that we've talked about over the last hour and a half as, as a group. So as we go to the uh, kind of the wrap up the, the final round table of this, Rob, you were on about an hour and a half ago or so when we watched this. What uh, you know what are your takeaways um, you know as input wise or some action items that are folks that are out here that are watching this that they can do either part of what you have or, or part of the group that they can move forward with? So I think for me, first thing what Joe just said about scheduling your emails I've had invisible PPC for eight years now. I've never had a weekly email go out until Joe made me do this. And to this day, I get emails from people going, you know, if you send a promotion, nobody replies to that. I get reply emails going, hey, Rob, that thing you just told me about, I think it's awesome. I use this or I want that in my life. And I'm going, oh, crap, I forgot I wrote that. That was months ago. Um, so it, it's true. You get great engagement for it. But... In terms of key takeaways for me, that's such an easy leverage win. You'd be crazy not to do it. Mike's absolutely right. Go help some local businesses. Be their savior. Be their light when they need some support. And package it in a way that Brian talked about. Make it low risk. Make it an easy yes. Make it good for them. And as Alicia said before, you know, help them with some new technology, with some routes to market they've perhaps not um, – thought of before there's a box of brownies sat in my kitchen right now that wouldn't be there without it and as chris said think about the older generation there they're online they're on social now the products and services you wouldn't have sold there before you absolutely can now yeah. awesome that's great and then mike what uh what, what party shots do you have for uh, or takeaways that you have for the for the folks that are watching this and watching them replay um well one i just want to say thanks to joe for a smart process like we all know that's one of those things like we all know we should be doing that and then we all make up in our heads why we're you know we, we don't get it done or whatever and it's like you know there's just a simple process to follow we can all get it done which is awesome um i, I think uh, you know takeaways for me um you know one i'm just i'm super hopeful for this next year and, and the opportunities ahead for all of us and for businesses i i personally believe that uh, the comeback is going to be a roaring, you know, comeback, and particularly for those who um, put a strategy in place to to take advantage of it. And so I'm just super thrilled to, you know, be a part of the community and watch everybody go out there and execute, and um, you know, take all these great ideas that you learned here today and and run with them, or even even just take one of them and and run with them, and that's that's going to go a long way. Yeah, Alicia, what do you think about Joe's uh, last thoughts and party shots from you for the for everybody that's watching the presentation? Yeah, so Rob and Mike already covered a lot, but what I really liked that he said was the PS and closing out the email with that PS, like, oh, by the way, you know. Um, and then I liked what he talked about consistency and sending out the emails on Sunday. I see that sending emails out on Sunday. I think that's like a gap too in all the emails that they get. Like there's the Sunday gap where they're not getting a lot of emails. And then he said he has an 80% open rate because he's sending it to his, you know, most attentive and engaged people on his list. And they're looking out for that email. So, you know, if you do something consistently, I'm guessing he also has it going out at a certain time, like every Sunday at two or whatever. 
then they're looking for it. And if they don't get it, they're probably going to send them a message like, I didn't get your email. Get which you're not. No. So that's one thing that I'm definitely going to add to my uh, to do list. Awesome. Yeah, we got a little bit of feedback. I think it's from the mic. I think we're good to go uh, on that. Brian, I know for, for you, uh, you know, we talk about a lot of email marketing and things like that and our stuff, but like for the final wrap up and, and a little bit about what Joe said as a summary, what are your thoughts and, and final takeaways from this? Yeah, I'm a big believer in what, what Joe said with the regular email communication. What you need to think about is you want a relationship with the reader, right? And that consistency that Joe talked about, it's, it's critical. And I want to tie it into a mistake that I make, and I know a lot of others do as well. Um, instead of finding a new strategy all the time for everybody kind of listening, instead of kind of going every which way, I want you to think about just refining what you have and working on your business instead of down in it, finding a way to be that CEO, to be the leader, the manager, and not the doer. I saw great comments about VAs on the call. It's 2021. I know most of us started as solopreneurs, but the reality is for two and $300, you can have a team member that really helps you execute on the vision. And if you find yourself weak in a certain area, like for instance, Joe's email, right? That, that regular stream of email, have somebody else do it. If you're the problem, take yourself out of that position, right? Be smart enough to say, hey, I need somebody that's gonna do that for me. And you're gonna find that you're gonna end up really growing because you, you've positioned yourself to do what you're good at. And it, it's not that you're going to ignore anymore what you, what you don't want to do, but you're going to have somebody else do it. And I think that is really, really going to help some of you. It, it's made a difference for me. There are so many things I'm not good at. And and that consistency of emails is one I preach as well. And I'm I'm still striving for, uh, for 100%. But, uh, but I love it. I love the presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. And thanks for so much for that. So Orbison, you know, we talked about social media. You could probably merge a little bit about what you're talking about with what Joe put together with the strategies and trying to keep their attention for those baby boomers or the old people, maybe even migrate a little bit to even the social side, take maybe away from email and, and add it into some of the, the strategies that you're using. You know, I was thinking the same thing. Uh, you know, Joe, just that concept is brilliant as far as like taking a short period of time to deep dive into uh, a process and then don't think about it again after that just get it done right the first time i think is applicable in lots of different areas of our marketing and it and it has to do automation like mike was talking about um that when you automate you become more efficient you make more money things like that and this is a good way that you can just automate your brain into using that pattern and that's one thing i'm going to take away because I, when i heard what you're going to talk about i was super looking forward to this because this is something that I don't do very well either, which is consistency in um, email marketing and social media is pretty good for consistency, but not, not email. And, um, and everything that you can use to communicate is important. And so I think in my parting thoughts is, um, and I learned this from Mario, this is a phrase I've never forgotten, massive imperfect action. Don't feel like you have to go in there and be perfect at this stuff. Just go in there and start doing it and refining it along the way. Because as you go and you start implementing these things that we've all kind of learned from each other today, um, your business will be better. And um, like, I'm super optimistic with this year too, and I'm super looking forward to it because we're going to come out on top of this as digital agencies. I mean, it's going to be a great year. So thanks, Jeff. Oh, thank you. And I agree with you 100%. Like there's, I'll talk about that here after uh, after Joe goes as we do the final wrap up. But Joe, I know, you know, it's just your your piece, but you know, for a pirate shot for the group, um, any final takeaway items or, you know, action items they should think at or, you know, some last little bit uh, moments to say uh, what you want to say? Yeah, I, I unfortunately missed uh, most of the presentations today. So I've given some recaps already, but I think at the end of the day, what's amazing is that everybody here presenting and adding value in this 2021 state of local marketing is part of a community, is part of a group, is a part of a mastermind. And we're just coming here to share with you guys. And I would highly recommend that you guys find a group to plug yourself into, to give you the, the peer network, the peer system, to, to really be able to grow your business, to be able to provide that constant feedback loop to you uh, and inspiration and to provide those aha moments because groups like this are just completely um, you know, invaluable. I mean, they have made the, the biggest difference in my professional life, uh, not only, but also my personal life and just how I operate as a human. 
So um, if there's one takeaway I can give is just like find an amazing group that like you'd be honored, like I'm honored today to be standing or sitting virtually safe distance, okay? Uh, with each and every one of the people on here. So awesome, Joe, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thanks to everybody that, that joined us today. Uh, we're just short of two hours, we're a little bit longer than we thought, but I think it was well worth it. All the, the amount of information and the actual items that you guys have. So. Real quick, you know, every single person you guys have seen are digital agency owners of some sort. We're product creators, software creators, and yes, we're educators in the space as well, because we do have a feeling of, you know, giving back and making sure that everybody has what they need. And over the last 12 months, you know, we've, this is the third in the last 52 weeks uh, of these calls that we've done because we thought that this was something that the industry needed and we needed to kind of give some guidance as, as we went through, you know, basically what happened of 2020 and now we're in the Q1 of, of, of 2021. And, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. We're seeing that rebirth, that reopen, is that reopening of businesses. And like Mike said earlier, the grand reopening. This is an opportunity that should really give you hope and should give you the excitement that yes, we're that's it. We've been you know been resting, and now it's time to get up and, and start running and, and sprinting for your business. And you're going to see there are a lot of businesses as the digital shift happens with the different opportunities, whether it be ads, social, contactless payments, text back marketing, uh, you know, creating an agency business model or even a social store to be able to, you know, have social commerce out there. There are a lot of things that you guys can do to really take the information that we've given you. Go back, pause this, watch it, take the individual that you were, um, you know, listening to uh, and put a comment down below the video where this be on a page, a YouTube channel, or in a specific group of what you thought or some of the takeaways and, and, and maybe ask to tag those folks and, uh, and maybe they can you know, give you a little bit of information of, of who they are and you can learn a little bit more about that path that you're willing to take. Because today our goal is to give you guys ideas, information, some golden nuggets, but really to inspire you and inspire you to go out there and help those local businesses build and, and, and grow and, and basically see that rebirth and that regrand opening from there. So with that being said, Thank you to everyone that was on the panel today. I appreciate each and every one of you guys coming and joining us. These are true experts in our industry. And I think over the last two hours, we've proven that just with the sheer information they've been showing and you know the proof of concepts that are working. And you don't have to do just one thing. We had a myriad of information that you guys can have and you can really implement each and every one of those from there. So with that being said, thank you for joining us for the state of the local marketing address. I think we're moving in a very positive direction um, as a group, as an, as an industry, and as, as a world, being able to help as digital agencies serve the local businesses in your area. And we look forward to seeing you guys in the next one and hopefully continue to show, hey, where we've come over the last several months. And I think each and every one of us on the call, you know, wish you guys the best of luck. We're excited for you. Tell your friends, tell other people that are watching this or that haven't seen this before, send them a link to this video because you guys can see we're here for you guys and we want to be able to spread that reach and help other digital agencies as well. So thank you for joining us on the state of the local marketing address and we'll see you guys on the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.